This is a CNIB Foundation podcast. The content in this podcast is provided for informational purposes only. It is not legal advice and should not be relied upon as such. CNIB does not make guarantees about the comprehensiveness or accuracy of the content. CNIB and the podcast participants assume no responsibility for how you use the information provided. If you require legal advice about a specific issue, contact a lawyer or community legal clinic. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Know Your Rights podcast, where our goal is to educate the public on knowing their rights regarding human rights related issues. My name is Jacob Chernoff, and I'm the host of this series. And as some of you may know at this point, or if it's your first time tuning in, this is a mission and passion for myself to educate and advocate for human rights, knowing your rights so that you can be informed to take care of yourself, both emotionally and physically, and that you're able to live a healthy, happy, fulfilled life. And I'm joined by Paul Ng and Jung Keel today to discuss employment human rights related issues. So guys, welcome to the show. I'm so glad you could join us today. Thank you. Thank you. And, you know, I think we'll, we'll jump right into it today because it's a really interesting topic. I think there's a lot of questions out there um, concerning the topic of employment or even getting employment um, when it comes to human rights and visible or um, invisible difference that people may be experiencing. And Paul, you've got a really interesting um, position right now. Um, you're working with the government, it looks like. It's been a, a long time that you've been there. And currently, you're working on a project to, um, to create accessible uh, cyberspace, essentially. I, I'd love to know a little bit more about that and how you got into that. I lost my job in 94, and I went back to school. I was a social worker uh, in my first profession. And I lost my job in 94, so I went back to school to do IT. And um, that was the roundabout before Y2K was a big issue. So my vocational evaluator or vocational uh, rehab counselor advised me to get into IT because of the demand for uh, IT professionals come Y2K. So that's how I started in IT. Then within the government that I'm working with for the last 22 years, I get moved around quite a bit for different projects. So in my current project, I'm doing testing for accessibility. That includes uh, document like PDF, Word documents, Excel, uh, HTML websites. Um, we also do accessibility testing for screen readers and any devices that needs to be uh, accessing information. So um, this is my latest project that I'm on, and the government intends to be a leader in this aspect. So by 2025, the objective is to have every information available for people with disabilities. So that's our objective, and that's part of the project that I'm currently on. Oh, that's an amazing initiative. Um, and I know myself as somebody um, who has a visual impairment, um, that's something really important um, as most of our information is consumed online in cyberspace. Um, you know, the accessible websites are, are kind of hit and miss, um, especially with content um, that's accessible. And I mean that in terms of what you can, uh, you know, download PDFs, websites, as you've mentioned. I think it's a really uh, amazing project that you're part of. But, you know, Paul, um, I understand that you also have um, some visual limitations and have recently experienced uh, some forms of discrimination at your job. Um, would you mind sharing a little bit more information about this and, you know, how this kind of all came to be? It seems like the government is, uh, you know, doing an amazing project, but you're uh, having some issues getting the accommodations you need to thrive and succeed in your position. Correct. I am legally blind. I have a one sight on uh, my, I only have a slight degree of vision on my left eye. So um, with regard to the challenges that I have at work was the, it was about a year ago that I get moved to this project. And um, in previous manage, dealing with my managers, they have been pretty good. Most of them in my 22 years history has been very accommodating, very approachable, very understanding. But with my recent change in managers, uh, it's a little bit of a, a challenge. He was not very uh, approachable and apparently he was not very accommodating. So um, 
having had been familiarized with the accommodation rules and regulations within the government, I know my rights. I basically know that with the Ontario Human Rights Commission, accommodation has to be provided. And it has to be provided to the point of hardship. And in this case, it wasn't to that point. So I have taken the initiative in the first place when I moved to re to be reporting to him. Uh, I informed him of my disabilities. I informed him of my need for accommodation. Uh, there was a hesitation to meet up. I waited after I informed him. And I knew on the website for the Ontario Human Rights uh, Laws that my role was to inform the managers as to what my disabilities are and to update them. And their responsibility was to accommodate. But when I didn't get a response back in a couple, I think it was about six months, I have decided to initiate that process again to get the accommodation conversation going. I make sure that I did it in black and white. In other words, I had it on emails. So that is, there's a record of our conversation and our initiation to, to get the process going so that it wouldn't be an issue as to, you know, when did I do this or when did he do this? So everything is on paper with email official correspondence. Now, um, it gets to a point whereby I have to go to the next level above him, which is the director. Mm -hmm. to mention that the accommodation was not being provided. And I felt like I'm not being make, uh, used to the maximum utilization. I wasn't being up, brought up to speed for my skills required. I thought I was being demoralized because I was not given enough work. So there was a lot of issues that were there. So the director got the human resources involved. So the human resources stepped in as an accommodation specialist. And as a result, that process was being enforced because human resources got involved here. Right. Um, you know, it's so hard to, to conceptualize that, you know, now in 2020 that some people don't really understand the importance of individualized accommodation. And I think that's a, a reoccurring topic that we'll have on this series is that just because we, you know, are kind of, I guess the best way to say it is boxed into a certain um, category as being visually impaired or um, loss of hearing or so on and so forth, that we need a certain type of accommodation. And it's so important to realize, and this goes beyond the scope of this, um, this episode and this project, but that everyone is individual and we need individual aspects to, to, to thrive and to succeed, not only in our, our roles at work, but in, in life, um, you know, as simple, something as simple as going grocery shopping. I know, and Paul, you've probably had this issue as well. Um, you know, reading the ingredients on a, on anything uh, is very hard. And, you know, being able to kind of navigate through all that is challenging. And I think a lot of this comes from um, discomfort from a lot of people, not really knowing how to approach the situation when you do um, request accommodations. And I think that there's a lot of education um, that needs to happen in the workplace for directors, managers, HR, um, HR individuals to, to help support and educate them on how to, to accept and be open to um, having those types of conversations that your manager wasn't really willing to to have with you to the point where you had to escalate it, um, you know, further and good for you for doing so. I know that there's a lot of people who experience very similar circumstances um, and people just not really understanding how to accommodate them, not wanting to learn, being uncomfortable with it and giving, as you said, menial tasks as a way to, you know, kind of sweep the issue under the rug. And that's not okay. I'm sure you're as talented, if not more talented than other people on your team, and you should be given the resources to, to thrive in your workplace. 
And I mean, I guess this is an interesting kind of segue into John Keel, how, like where, what is being done in the workplace to support um, people who require accommodations? What, you know, is, what's the, the rights on this? What are the legal kind of um, parameters that are set for workplaces and uh, providing accommodations? Excellent question. So um, there, there are protections under the laws, both in Ontario and federally and in other provinces that uh, protect individuals in this type of situation. So under, uh, in Ontario, under the Human Rights Code, um, every person has a right to a workplace free of discrimination and harassment on the basis of a disability, including a visual impairment, uh, which is a recognized disability within the meaning of human rights legislation. And further to that, employers have a legal duty to reasonably accommodate individuals with a disability to the point of undue hardship. Sorry, Jean Kiel, I'm just going to in here because that's a, a term that we've come across a few times today, and I just want to clarify that um, for our viewers and listeners. Do you mind just explaining what undue hardship is? Because I know that's a really important um, point for people to understand this episode. Yeah. So un undue hardship is uh, a situation in which because of either excessive cost or because of a health and safety issue or because of uh, legal restrictions, it may not be, uh, the employer may not be in a position to reasonably accommodate. Um, but it's a very, very high threshold. It's very, uh, it, it's very difficult for employers to actually establish a new hardship, it, especially for larger employers, like large financial institutions, the government that, that have significant resources. It's going to be very difficult for them to justify not being able to reasonably accommodate on account of cost. Uh, so, so in the accommodation process, it's expected that there will be some cost, some inconvenience to an employer, um, but they have that duty. And it's only to the point where it becomes excessive in nature that they can say that they, they cannot accommodate in circumstances. Um, an example could be whereby, you know, the, the accommodation would be such that two people need to be hired to do one job. I, I think that the, the duty to accommodate would, would stop short of that, for instance. Um, but it is a very, very high threshold and very difficult for employers to, to justify not accommodating someone on the basis of undue hardship. Yeah, and I mean, Paul, um, you know, as we were discussing before and kind of reading for some notes, it, it looks like you had requested um, a, a job coach or something along those lines to help you uh, kind of adapt to um, the the new role. Is that correct? Correct. There was, uh, because of the IT profession, uh, there has to be a knowledge transfer aspect of it. And because I was moving from a new pro to a new project, the requirement for knowledge transfer is critical. And because of the limited access to some of those uh, documents, I have specifically requested for a job coach. Now, my biggest issue with my current manager is that accommodation wasn't provided timely mm -hmm. because I waited up to a year before I got a job coach. So my issue with them was the fact that it wasn't accommodated timely, which is one of the human rights requirements. Right. And yeah, I mean, I, I'm glad to hear that, you know, you finally did get the accommodation, but waiting, you know, 12 months, a year to to get that, that's, I mean, that that seems to me at least a little unreasonable. Um, What's the, you know, is there a time frame on, you know, a request for accommodation to fulfilling the accommodation? Is there some sort of parameter for that? Uh, interesting question. So in terms of the duty to accommodate, there's both a procedural duty and a substantive duty. So the procedural duty to accommodate entails what is the process by which we arrive at an accommodation, right? And if accommodation is necessary and, and how does that accommodation fit that individual's needs? So there's no hard and fast rule with respect to the timing around that, um, but it has to be, as you say, reasonable in nature given the circumstances. So it strikes me on the face of it that 12 months is an excessive period of time to, to respond to such a simple request. Um, so, so the procedural duty to accommodate involves taking into consideration that individual's request, respecting um, the dignity and, and confidentiality of the process, 
folks, responding in a timely manner, responding in a respectful manner, and being open to, to what those requests are, uh, recognizing that every accommodation is going to be individualized based on the unique needs of the person and shouldn't be um, based on stereotyped, uh, stereotypical notions about what that person's impairments are or what their needs are. Yeah, I, I am uh, glad to hear that because, uh, as I mentioned before, that's something that really, um, you know, so to say, grinds my gears. And I, I know that that's really subjective to, to say coming from me, but I've experienced it firsthand. Um, some of you may know a little bit about my background being legally blind and facing some um, human rights disputes that are ongoing. And um, I was put into a, a blanket. Um, of being visually impaired and that based on that box, those would be reasonable accommodations where they really weren't as somebody who is a, a very high functioning, um, you know, owns a tech company. Um, I require a different set of accommodations to be at an equal playing ground um, for, you know, doing what the, the role was, um, you know, in this case, uh, an exam. Anyway, to get back to this, I, I think, you know, something that I'd be really interested in is what is the responsibility of the employer um, in terms of educating their staff? You know, especially in larger organizations, we have, you know, many multiple layers of management, um, speaking from managers to directors to VPs to uh, executives, so on and so forth. Are there resources available um, or some? type of enforcement that these companies need to educate their, their management staff on accommodations, what is reasonable, how to approach individuals who require accommodation, so on and so forth? Excellent question. So, um, you know, an employer just saying, hey, we accommodate is not enough. Um, in order for an accommodation to actually have meaning and, and to be practically implemented, um, that's typically done uh, through various layers of management, but it has to be done at, 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 you know, even the lowest levels of management. They have to understand how to deal with it. They have to know, well, what's the policy? Do I get HR involved? What's the process? Um, so the employer would and should make sure that their management is sufficiently informed and trained on their accommodation policies. You know, having a policy in and of itself won't be enough. They have to know, um, they have to educate their supervisors, they have to educate management, will actually be implementing the, the policy, right? The implementing the specific accommodation. So there should be first written policies that actually create, uh, that allow individuals to know what their rights are and what their responsibilities are as part of that co accommodation process. It's a two-way street, right? The individuals seeking accommodation have to make their needs known and they, they have to know that they, they should be doing that as part of the accommodation policy. Likewise, supervisors have to know that they have to respond meaningfully to these requests for accommodation. The only way to do that is to sufficiently educate and train uh, management supervisors, employees on what the accommodation process is and what each of the respective um, obligations and rights are of the parties involved. And, and for more sophisticated organizations, large organizations where they have, you know, uh, HR processes, you know, an HR department. Typically, such a policy would entail getting human resources involved because they they would have knowledge on on how to go about doing this in, in the in the appropriate fashion. I would expect that you know, particularly for the province, that they would have a specific department or set of staff that deal with those types of requests and, and, and concerns. I think that's such an excellent point that I that has been kind of overshadowed at this point. It is a two way street. Um, you know, we need to, um, as somebody who might require accommodation, um, I need to approach it or you guys need to approach it in a, in a way that um, kind of follows the policy. Obviously, there's extenuating circumstances where this, you know, there might be some um, disconnect there, but it never hurts to reach out and find out, um, you know, what the accommodation policies are um, before going against them. And maybe that's, um, you know, the uh, part of the issue why there is a disconnect. I think it's really communication and um, employers not letting um, individuals, whether they have um, required accommodations or not, know that there is a request 
accommodation policy, and so on and so forth. So I really think it's important um, for you guys listening and watching to, to, you know, advocate for yourselves, find out what the, the policies are, how you can go about getting what you require um, before, you know, getting defensive. And I mean, I know it's a really sensitive, personal, and even emotional um, kind of issue not getting what you need, but sometimes it's asking and finding out the information um, beforehand. So just make sure that, you know, if you are in a situation with a current employer, um, that you do, you know, do a little bit of uh, investigation as to what the accommodation process or application process is for that organization. Can I just interject a little bit here? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we have passed into law now, the AODA, the Accessibility for Ontarian with Disability Act. So if anybody wants to know more about this act, which is now legislated, it is a need, it is legally required for accommodation. And it's the, again, it's the Accessibility for Ontarian with Disability Act, AODA. And you can read up on the requirements. And a lot of companies are now required to set up policies and strategies in regard to training management and staff on accommodation, inclusion, and diversity. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks Thanks for sharing that, Paul. We'll have some um, links in the description or somewhere around this video um, where you guys can read up um, on that and get some more information there. And, you know, one quick thing um, that kind of, I see more and more of um, in being uh, an entrepreneur myself, small business is kind of this strange gray area of um, accommodation because it is a startup. There's a lack of resources. You kind of run into this, you know, um, variable as to what is undue hardship to a company that's not generating any revenue um, up front. Are there any provisions for small businesses or um, resources that, you know, um, you know, business owners um, who might not have that type of experience um, from a larger organization can, can go to to learn about how to accommodate their, um, their staff? So, so in terms of small businesses finding out about what their obligations are and, and how do you go about informing themselves of, of the accommodation obligations, it's certainly there are a lot of helpful resources out there. Uh, there may be government supports, government funding for, for specific um, you know, uh, needs. If there's equipment or other things that need to be purchased, uh, there may be government subsidies available for uh, smaller businesses. Um, but in terms of finding out about their um, obligations to, to their employees, certainly there are excellent resources through the Ontario Human Rights Commission. Uh, for federally regulated employers, there's, there's similar resources at the federal level uh, through the Canadian Human Rights Commission um, and various other agencies that might be able to uh, provide some gen general information about their obligations vis-a-vis uh, -vis employees. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, thanks for sharing that. And I think my my kind of point there was, you know, if you guys are working for a smaller company um, that's a startup or a small business, um, you guys are protected and able to access the same resources as somebody uh, working for an, or a larger company. So don't right. shy away from that. Don't let that be um, an impediment on shying away from, you know, getting the accommodations you require to to thrive in your role. And on that point, so to the extent, like, do, are there a different set of standards for small businesses versus large businesses? The obligation is the same, regardless of the size of the employer. They have a duty to accommodate, uh, reasonably accommodate to the point of undue hardship. So it, it, the size of the employer doesn't matter. Um, there may be, uh, the, there, there could be an argument that a smaller business may not have the same level of resources as a larger uh, business, and they may, they may hit the undue hardship hardship threshold um you know much earlier uh, there there could be an argument that you know we can't um incur the type of cost that a larger well-resourced organization could but they they still have a duty to investigate that look at that objectively um look at their you know their budget and the resources that they may have so they can't just conceptually close their mind and say we're a small employer we can't help you out we just can't afford it there actually has to be objective evidence to establish well well, this is going to be excessive and 
And let's look at the balance sheet. Let's look at the costs. Let's look at other types of accommodations that may be more affordable for us that can actually work. Right. Um, so, so there's going to be an objective analysis there. They can't just shut it down by saying we're small, we can't afford it. Um, they have to go through that analysis. They have to assess the needs. And um, in order to avoid that obligation, or at least to say that we have, we've done that, we've done all we can do, they'd have to show that there's they've hit undue hardship. That is, there's excessive costs and, and they just can't, they can't accommodate the circumstances. It's still a high threshold. Yeah, totally. Uh, important note for you guys. I know there are a lot more small businesses popping up and startups and things like that, especially now with kind of uh, the digitization of a large part of the economy. Um, so guys, if you are experiencing that, make sure to, um, you know, talk with your employer, be it small business, uh, large business, um, be involved in the process. Um, if, you know, your accommodations don't seem reasonable up front, um, you know, get involved. Ask, you know, well, what, why not? Um, ask those questions. Don't be afraid of it. Um, it's really important, um, not only for yourselves, but to prevent this happening in the future for other people. That's why this series exists. We're really trying to advocate for sustainable change in the field of knowing your rights and human rights. Um, so I have a couple more questions. I hope you guys um, don't mind sticking around, um, just because I think I'm really interested in this topic, and I think it's going to be a uh, really interesting one for our viewers. Um, I guess, number one, Paul, um, where, are, where are you at with the accommodation? process now have you gotten the accommodations you need or are you still um, waiting for those to roll in as a matter of fact the good news is uh, as soon as you know your rights and you stick to the rules and regulations as your roles and responsibilities require of you like in the Ontario Human Rights Commission it does specify as to what the employee roles are and what the employer roles are I have done my responsibility of informing them of my need for accommodation. I've provided them my medical reports. I've also uh, clearly stated what my accommodation needs are required. I have got exactly what I required. I have got a job coach now. I've been uh, transferred to the knowledge that I needed, the training that I needed. And um, it sometimes needs a bit of a pushing and to know what you know is critical because the thing is that management will not do anything unless you know, they know that you know what you know. Yeah, I'm so happy to hear that, Paul. Really, you're, uh, you're, you're such a great example of somebody who is pushing uh, to really get what they require. And, you know, congratulations. I'm, I'm really um, excited to hear that. I'm sure our, our viewers will be as well. And, you know, what you're sharing now is, is going to make change for the future. So others don't have to experience the, you know, ridiculous timeframes to get the accommodations that you've experienced, or even the, um, you know, awkward back and forth between management and yourself. And one thing, though, um, be very constructive. Don't go into uh, a, a situation whereby you're looking for conflicts. Uh, just be be flexible. I think creating trust between managers and yourself is very important. Uh, be very credible, uh, respectful. And I think when you do that, when you approach it in a positive uh, manner, management are a bit more open and accommodating but do it in a very diplomatic way. And then I find it to be one of the, the reasons why I'm so successful in doing this is because I don't look for conflict. I kind of seek for solutions. And at the same time, uh, don't demand, make it something that is negotiable and uh, always be building trust between you and management. That's why it's very important. I think that's, I mean, you know, Words of wisdom, really. I mean, you guys have heard Paul's story. Um, you've seen the outcome. And I, I think that kindness goes a long way um, on all facets of life. Um, I know that it, it can be, uh, it is an emotional process, um, no, no doubt about it. And sometimes our emotions can overrun how we react uh, to different things. And if you look at it from the way that Paul did, is 
you can control your reaction and your response to a situation. And uh, if you can go about it as mindfully as Paul uh, was able to, um, you know, you're more likely to at least be heard uh, of what you're you're looking for. So, Paul, thank you for that. Uh, really, really great advice, and I'm sure that uh, it'll be definitely uh, tangible for a lot of our viewers and listeners. Now, one thing I did want to talk about, I think to close this episode up, is we've talked a lot about employment from the perspective of already having a job. But what if you're looking for a job and find barriers on that front? I mean, I know when I was younger and looking for um, jobs, a lot of them required uh, like a, a test or something like that or a driver's license which somebody with a visual impairment, um, I'm unable, legally unable to drive a car. So that immediately puts a barrier on entry. Um, and it, it, it could have been the greatest position in the world. I could have been the most qualified person, but because I have a physical limitation and can't drive a car, all of a sudden um, I'm, I've hit a brick wall. Where does kind of accommodation and human rights come at that? Um, I, I, that's a really interesting one. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, Sean Keel. Uh, excellent question. So the duty to accommodate exists at all stages of the employment relationship, including at the recruitment stage. So it just in terms of finding out about a job opportunity, ensuring that the job advertisement is in an accessible format, ensuring that individuals are able to meaningfully participate in a job competition, that they're not uh, you know, precluded based on some sort of limitation that they may have. There could be jobs where they, there could be written examinations or other forms of examinations or assessments um, that are a part of that job competition. And they have to ensure that that is conducted in a manner that allows everybody to participate meaningfully. And they may have to adjust those standards or the format within which they're, um, they're deploying as part of that recruitment process. Now, when it comes to standards that may be required as, as part of the job, that, that's a very, very interesting question because um, there may be certain standards where, whereby a certain level of vision is an essential requirement mm -hmm. of the job. And so they may not, an employer may not be able to modify that, that vision requirement, let's say, um, because it would be, um, it may be difficult to, to actually ensure that that individual is able to safely um, carry out the essential requirements of the position. But in order to establish that if a certain level of vision is required for the job, they have to show that that vision standard is rationally connected to the performance of the job. It has to be adopted in good faith, and it must be reasonably necessary for the job itself. Um, so in order to show that it's reasonably necessary, the employer would have to show that it's impossible to provide an accommodation without incurring undue hardship. Yeah. An example could be that, you know, a pilot who's flying a plane is going to be held to a high standard of vision, of course, and it, and it would be probably undue hardship if they have a significant vision impairment to operate an, an, a plane. That That's a very extreme example, but but to the point that, you know, there, the, the standard has to show that there, there is some essential and good faith component here that, that they need that, to have those standards in place. Now, on that point, there's also a recent decision, which may be very interesting to your viewers um, and those listening. There's, there's a recent decision that was released by the Ontario Superior Court actually this month. So the time is quite interesting for this podcast, um, whereby um, a visually impaired person um, what lost her job because of uh, she lost her sight in one eye, mm -hmm. and uh, she was a bus driver for Oakville Transit for a number of years, and she uh, she got cancer, lost her vision in one eye, and as a result, uh, lost her license. So she wasn't challenging the employer in this case; she was challenging the standard that was applying that the province was applying by revoking her license. They were saying, well. It's not safe. We can't have somebody who has vision and only one eye safely operate a bus. It's not safe to do so. Therefore, we're retracting your license. Um, and she was saying, hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Um, give me a chance to demonstrate that I can actually drive a bus safely. Um, and they're saying, no, we're not going to do that. The general rule is that you need to have 
that level of vision in both eyes in order to, to operate the vehicle. So she, she actually challenged that regulation and was successful. The Ontario Superior Court held that, that wait a minute, that, that standard that you're applying is not, um, is based on preconceived notions about, um, one's ability. Um, to operate safely on the basis of, uh, you know, vision in one eye. There was evidence to suggest that she actually, she still had her G-level license and she had, um, she led evidence in connection with being able to actually um, have a safe driving record. Um, and all she wanted was the opportunity to take a test. So the, the Ontario Support Bureau Report agreed that, that that a blanket standard like that was not reasonable and so they they uh, rendered that provision unconstitutional, and they're giving the province an opportunity to adapt to adapt the regulation to ensure that there's um, some uh, standard that allows that that's going to be assessed based on the individualized ability to actually safely operate a vehicle in that instance. Very timely indeed for uh, yeah. this episode. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm gonna um, just throw out a scenario that I think might be uh, interesting for um, some viewers, and I, I know um, I've definitely seen it or had seen it online. Um, so let's kind of just play out a scenario here. I'd love to hear what the kind of what how how one might approach this from a legal perspective. Um, so a, an employer posts a job posting for a sales job online. Um, and a G level license or a driver's license is required. Um, the obviously, if there's somebody who can't drive a car due to a physical um, limitation, that would be off the table. However, w is that necessary to fulfill the role? And how could somebody approach um, the employer to? Um, to discuss this opportunity further. I mean, I think that there's a lot more at play with this type of scenario, but I think it's something that um, is quite relevant. I see it, um, I've seen it a lot. Um, we post jobs and I, I know that it's out there of having a requirement that is not truly crucial to fulfilling the role of a sales agent. It's just a nice to have. Um, yeah. Like, How would somebody go about approaching an employer. I mean, if you, you know, write, yes, I have my driver's license, then, you know, you're deceitful on the application, but that's going to get you in the door, perhaps. Um, where on the other hand, you, press, you, you know, click no on one of these job sites, and immediately you're disqualified from the role. And it's not, I, I don't think that's fair, uh, per se. That's just my opinion. But I know that there's probably people who have come across a certain, uh, you know, similar circumstance. Right. So, so I think that that is a concern that, that um, they're disqualifying candidates based on uh, a need for a driver's license because you're actually ruling out individuals who are unable to drive due to a physical disability, including a visual impairment. So, so the generic rule or standard here might be, you know, uh, it might not be targeting certain individuals on account of disability, but it's adversely impacting them, right? Because they're not able to um, have an opportunity to be assessed based on the merits, their their ability to fulfill the job requirements. I think in this type of situation, if it's a sales job, I mean, it really, there, there's a real question here as to whether, is it really an essential requirement of the position? Can they meaningfully fulfill the essential requirements, which is sales. It's not to drive. She's not driving a bus or he or she wouldn't be called upon to drive a bus or operate a motor vehicle as part of the job. They're not applying to be an Uber driver. They're applying to be a salesperson. So um, I could think of many different scenarios in which somebody could fill sales without having to travel or drive a car. I mean, they could take alternative means of transportation. Uh, public transit, they, you know, to the extent that there might be travel between cities, there could be other forms of transportation available. They may even have a support person who may be you not know, part of payroll, but they may have a support person that may drive them from point A to point B. Um, or it may be the case that they conduct, can conduct the sales without actually having to physically travel, especially at this day and age where we have lots of technology where, whereby even today we have a format like Zoom whereby we don't necessarily need to meet in person. So there. Um, so I think it begs the question, you'd have to investigate whether that is it really an essential part of the job duties. Uh, I, I would, you know, I, I think it's questionable if it's a sales role, but, you know, I'd like to find out more about that in assessing whether or not it's truly essential. So 
Um, I think on the face, that type of qualification could be in and of itself discriminatory. Yeah, I mean, and it's such a hard thing to enforce as well. I mean, like if you're looking for a job um, and trying to appease a potential employer, most likely the the first impression you don't want to make is saying, hey, your job posting is discriminatory. <laughs> yeah. So to your, I guess the second part of your question is how do you go about approaching them? I mean, you can still apply for the job. I mean, if they're just going to, you don't even get your foot in the door in terms of, because you have to check out the box. And if you don't get to stage two, how do you even communicate with them? I mean, there could be an opportunity to reach out to say, hey, you know, I saw your job advertisement. I think I'm highly qualified for the job. Um, you know, I don't have a license, but, you know, I have an ability to travel or I have other means or, you know, I'd like to discuss other, other formats or other ways that I can actually fulfill the essential job duties um, and approach it that way, you know, on a practical level to see if, if um, you can, you know, get your foot in the door. I know that on a practical, they have a duty, they have a duty to consider that and assess it um, to the extent you feel like you're being, uh, you know, disqualified unfairly because of your visual impairment. You may have to challenge them on that. Um, you know, that's that's obviously the last recourse. I mean, your your ideal scenario is you get the job, right? And so that that could again, the duty to accommodate is a two way street, and so that would entail um, requesting that type of accommodation. I'd like to get my foot in the door. I'd like to have an opportunity to have an interview or at least be considered for this role, and then take it from there. And ideally, you know, if they're they're really assessing this and giving you a fair shot, they should be compliant. And they that they should be they should be reciprocating in that. Yeah. And I mean, just, I mean, at this stage, I think there's a really kind of tricky um, scenario and thank you for, um, you know, on the spot responding to these uh, kind of scenarios, but I think it's really um, relevant. I think there's a lot of people who have uh, either are currently having experience with that or have had it in the past, you know, since there is no management or HR department involved in this type of scenario, what is the step to kind of proceed? Well, I think it, on a practical level, if you're a job candidate, you're concerned that you might be disqualified, um, you know, you'd either approach the person, the employer uh, or the contact. If you can find a contact person to reach out to, you'd be doing that uh, proactively, uh, either on your own or potentially through a support person. Um, that, that on a practical level, that strikes me as a you know, very practical way to try to resolve it, going through their HR department. If there is one um, and asking about their, you know, what kind of accommodation policies you have. Again, employers are required to have written accommodation policies and, and to inform candidates about um, their accommodation policies. And, and so, so they, they, they're, that's a two way street. So certainly to, to the individual who's concerned that, that they, you know, they may not have these formalized channels. Um, you know, I, I would I would just recommend uh, trying to reach out to, to the um, the people in charge of that job competition or their human resources department, and then if they're not responding, you may have to challenge this or or escalate it. Ideally, that's not the scenario, um, but there are there are mechanisms by which people can get recourse for um, you know for unlawful discrimination. What just out of curiosity, what would that be? You know, if it gets to that point where um, either you're said, no, I'm sorry, that is a, uh, a required element of the job to have a, a driver's license, uh, you know, in this sales job, for instance, but I'm sure there's multiple um, kind of relatives to that. Um, how do you proceed? I mean, especially uh, like, I don't know, having a job is, you know, really important, especially, um, you know, just to to survive, especially here in Toronto, it's such an expensive city. And to find a, a job that you're extremely qualified for um, is getting harder and harder to find with all of these, uh, you know, evolving um, technical demands and things like that. You find your dream job and all of a sudden you're, you know, you're brick walled um, due to some sort of um, silly requirement that probably the employer doesn't even know is on their job posting. Um, mm -hmm. And you get the no, we require the driver's license. Um, we're not responding to you. Do you go to the Human Rights Commission or is there kind of an intermediary step? So, um, excellent question. So, in terms of finding out about, um, in terms of obtaining an appropriate form of recourse here, if you can't, if you can't reasonably work it out with the, the employer or potential employer in this instance, 
there are um, channels by which you can get that recourse. Um, so, for example, one could apply uh, for a remedy under the human rights um, uh, under the human rights code. So they can make an application before the Ontario Human Rights Tribunal. Um, they could, if it's a federally regulated entity, they can apply to. They can make a complaint submitted to the Canadian Human Rights Commission. For those who may be listening from other provinces, they have similar channels uh, through respective human rights tribunals or commissions. Um, in the courts, also potentially may be a channel of recourse. There are in limited circumstances uh, an ability to make a, a claim before the courts to seek relief if it's um, tied to another cause of action, typically not at the recruitment stage, but Normally, in for employees who may be suffering discrimination or were unlawfully terminated in breach of their rights under the Human Rights Code, they can, you know, they, they may be seeking wrongful dismissal damages, but also compensation for a breach of their rights under the Human Rights Code. So there are various tribunals or courts or various mechanisms by which one can achieve some type of recourse. If you are, you know, currently an employee of the organization and you're unionized, then you can file a grievance. Uh, through your union um, under the collective agreement and, um, and, and seek recourse to the grievance arbitration process. So there are a variety of different uh, recourses available to individuals in that type of context. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's really, really good information. Um, I certainly kind of was opened up to a, a few interesting options there. So I hope that has helped um, you guys learn a little bit more about um, some different scenarios that you may or may uh, run into down the road. Hopefully not, as we're really trying to pave the way for change with Know Your Rights um, so that you can thrive and succeed as an individual, not only in your employment situations, but in, in your entire life. So, Paul, I really want to thank you for sharing your story. Um, you really are um, exactly what we're, you embody what we're trying to achieve with this of advocating for yourself for change and paving the way to uh, make accessibility and accommodations um, just the new status quo um, in the workplace. So thank you so much, Paul. And Jean-Kiel, um, your responses have been unbelievably informative. And actually, um, if there's people who want to reach out to you directly, is there a way that people can um, you know, connect with you if they have more specific questions? Absolutely. So they, they can, um, my contact information is on our website. So uh, my law firm is Pack Smith Employment Lawyers. So you can find us on the web and you can find my contact information there. So feel free to reach out if you do have questions that, that pertain to uh, discrimination or accommodations in the workplace, accommodations in connection with the recruitment process. Um, feel free to reach out if you um, have any any general questions. We're there. This is an area that we specialize in. Uh, we, we deal with it all the time in the context of employment law. It comes up quite a bit, unfortunately. Wonderful. Yeah, we'll, we'll include um, the, the link to the website um, in the description or somewhere, depending where this is. But you'll be able to find that if you guys want to reach out to John Keel directly. Thank you so much for listening, watching um, this episode. I hope that you've learned something. I know it was a little bit longer, but I, I really think that we got a lot of value out of it. I know I certainly did and have learned a thing or two. So guys, remember, don't be afraid to be a change maker. Your change impacts the future and Know Your Rights is all about advocating for sustainable change so that you can become the best version of yourself. Until next time, we'll see you then. For more CNIB Foundation podcasts, visit cnib.ca slash podcasts.